The chair recognizes the right honorable member for Centerville. And Mr. Speaker, I rise <clears throat> on this occasion to present the 2012-2013 budget communication. <clears throat> but before I do, as this is the first opportunity I would have had to speak to your elevation to high office, I would wish to join those of my colleagues who have indicated their pleasure at seeing someone like yourself assume the office of Speaker of the House of Assembly in the Commonwealth of the Bahamas. We have had a very rigorous and hotly contested political campaign mm -hmm which has resulted in those of us on this side being given the privilege to govern. Whenever someone like yourself, young, qualified, representing the future of our country, agrees to accept an office that takes you out of the area of combat. It is good for us to recognize that you are indeed <clears throat> making a major commitment to the well-being of our country because you are very qualified to be sitting right here on this front bench. Mm -hmm. And so I would wish your constituents to know that you have given of yourself, your time, your abilities to help us move forward to the level of maturation that you have advocated and admonished us in this House of Assembly to reach by simply and eloquently saying, mm -hmm. our children are watching. Mm -hmm. So for this side, we are going to endeavor to meet that expectation because we know and we know all so well that it is important for us to set the right example, especially at this time in our Commonwealth for the young people of our country. It is my honor, sir, to present this budget communication. With this, <coughs> the first budget of the new mandate with which the Bahamian people have entrusted my government, we launch our program to transform the Bahamian economy and society for the benefit of all Bahamians. The key policy thrusts of the 2012-13 budget are faithful to the major themes that we enunciated in both our Charter for Governance and last week's speech for the throne. <clears throat> Unless there be any doubt, the Charter for Governance of which we will speak and refer to liberally during this five-year term is this document. It contains the very, very considered view of members of this side, and it is our quest, our challenge, and our intention to bring about the full execution of what this document that we describe as the Charter contains. I therefore would wish now to state at the very outset of this communication that we do not propose to increase any taxes on Bahamians in this budget. This budget unequivocally sets us on the course of change that we pledge to initiate and pursue with diligence 
and dedication. However, in the light of the very short time since our return to government, this budget is but the very first step in that process of transformation. I would highlight that we have already implemented two of the actions that are in our charter for governance and that we committed and that we committed to implement in the first 100 days of our coming to office. Specifically, we have already created the Ministry for Grand Bahama and re-established the Ministry of Financial Services. As we move forward, we will be guided by the vision for the future set out in the Charter. That beacon will illuminate the way and ensure that we make steady and concrete progress in securing the overriding economic and social objectives that are vital to, the prosper to a prosperous and harmonious society. I will note, therefore, at the outset that our room for maneuver is, at least in the short term, severely constrained by the dire fiscal situation <coughs> that has been handed to us by the previous administration. As I will set out in detail below, the government's deficit and debt levels at this time are much worse than we had anticipated. <clears throat> we have been left with sizable ongoing capital expenditure commitments and a legacy of contracts entered into during the final days of the formal, former administration. We are committed to putting an end to such practices. As we stated in the speech from the throne, we will table legislation to prevent the entering into of government contracts, including contracts of, em of employment, which for the former administration went right up to the day of the election. Yes. Very Such contracts of employment or the payment of public money monies therewith between the date of dissolution of parliament and the date of general elections, unless such contracts or payments are predetermined by an independent statutory body to be absolutely essential for the maintenance of essential services. In addition, as a matter of priority, we will do whatever is necessary such that going forward the government is properly positioned to more efficiently and effectively function and ensure that public monies are properly spent and accounted for and that we avoid the types of cost overruns that have recently been witnessed. We will pay particular attention to the large capital expenditure projects that are already in the pipeline. We will monitor these closely to ensure that contract terms are respected and that the government is receiving full value for money in respect of these significant expenditure commitments. I should also say that we also face the carryover into 2012-2013 of certain recurrent expenditure commitments of the previous administration in respect of promotion, the promotions exercise, back pay, salary increases, and the payment of insurance benefits. Accordingly, my government is firmly committed to fiscal prudence and the return of the fiscal accounts to more desirable <coughs> and sustainable positions. 
We will need to adopt flexible, innovative, and fiscally responsible approaches as we initiate our comprehensive program of legislative proposals and policy initiatives to address the key economic and social challenges of our country. In particular, with our fiscal flexibility as constrained as it is, we will focus our efforts on promoting the expansion of the private sector, which holds the key to the creation of sustainable job opportunities. We will eschew job programs of the type introduced by the previous administration, which ballooned from an initial estimate of $25 million to some $48 million, all the while lacking any focus on viable long-term employment creation. We fully appreciate that it will be imperative to rebuild the fiscal buffers over time. The significant structural fiscal reforms, therefore, that I will propose in this budget, especially in respect of the government's revenue base and revenue administration, will be critical in this regard. The stronger, sustainable fiscal position that will result from these measures will facilitate the full implementation of our agenda for change and will underpin enhanced confidence and more buoyant growth and job creation. I'd like to move to immediate initiatives in our program of change. Building a safer Bahamas. We have unambiguously expressed our firm commitment to the implementation of a national crime agenda as one of the two central priorities of our program of change. As a first step, we are immediately, when I say immediately, I mean immediately, following up on our commitment to reinstate and reinvigorate the Urban Renewal Program to foster a beneficial and effective relationship between the police and the community. Yeah. Within the fiscally responsible budget allocations presented in this budget, we will begin to develop and implement the many legislative policy and program initiatives in our agenda to combat crime, namely <clears throat> amendments to the Police Act, the creation of a national intelligence agency, the development of a national firearms control strategy, including the establishment of a firearms department and database, the reintroduction of the Swift Justice Initiative, the reintroduction of the Witness Protection Program, amendments to the Rehabilitation of Offenders Act, the reintroduction of school-based policing, the revitalization of the Tourism-Based Police Initiative, and <clears throat> the re-equipment and repositioning of the Royal Bahamas Defense Force to more effectively control our borders. Both our Charter for Governance and the speech from the throne speak to the need to determine the extent of interest among the Bahamian population in establishing a national lottery and or decriminalizing and properly regulating the web shop type gaming business. It is estimated that this area holds the potential to make a significant financial contribution in support of government expenditures on the nation's economic and social priorities in the years ahead. Accordingly, we will soon present the details of a national referendum on the issue. Should it be deemed that it is in the national interest, de development work on the necessary legal and administrative framework will be finalized. 
promoting industry and creating jobs. <laughs> the second core imperative of our program of change is the strengthening of the domestic economy and the attendant creation of jobs, the broadening of Bahamian ownership in the economy, and the attainment of a higher standard of living. To that end, the government will refocus the mandate of the Development Bank and the Bahamas Agricultural and Industrial Corporation to broaden their range of activities beyond merely lending money to include the provision of equity, credit guarantees, and marketing and accounting support. We remain faithful to our commitment to explore all lawful means by which majority ownership of BTC can be restored to the government and the Bahamian people. We shall very shortly arrange a timetable for discussions that we propose to undertake in this regard with the present owners of the majority stake in BDC and other interested stakeholders. As a means of stimulating the real estate market and the construction sector, the government is following up on its commitment to reduce the stamp duty rate on conveyances over 250,000 dollars from 12% to 10%. As for the other rates of stamp duty, I would note that first-time homeowners, homeowners already benefit from the existing exemption from stamp duty. The government will, however, review the entire structure of stamp duties on conveyances in the context of the overall program of fiscal reform. <clears throat> in addition, we are introducing again a cap of $50,000 as the maximum real property tax payable on an owner-occupied residence as a means of further stimulating the construction sector. In order to stimulate near-term job creation for small contractors, we are also announcing that an allocation is being made in this budget for home repairs and community improvements under the auspices of both the Urban Renewal Program and the Ministry of Housing. I am also announcing, with some pleasure, that Exuma is being reinstated for eligibility under the Family Island Development Encouragement Act. <laughs> Assistance to homeowners in distress. The loss of a home or threat of a loss is emotionally devastating for any family. We therefore reaffirm our commitment to a mortgage relief program that will help save the homes of those persons who, by reason of involuntary job losses, underemployment, or chronic illness, are no longer able to service their mortgage loan obligations as they were previously doing. Preliminary discussions with representatives of the clearing banks and other institutional lenders have already been initiated, and these discussions will continue with a view to arriving at a mortgage relief program in the shortest possible time. In the meantime, however, we wish to reiterate 
that the program was never intended to assist homeowners who have the means to pay their mortgage obligations, but simply decided not to do so. We therefore strongly urge all homeowners who have the means to do so to continue to meet their mortgage loan obligations as and when they fall due. <clears throat> Mr. Speaker, the final draft of a bill to administer and regulate pension funds is now complete and will be presented to Parliament shortly. As was stated in the speech from the throne, we will ensure that employees have access to their pension savings for emergency purposes, including mortgage relief. We will do so within the broader context of the revised bill to which I have just referred. Mr. Speaker, the economic plight of Grand Bahama is painfully evident and the unemployment situation there clearly attests to this reality. The government has firmly expressed its commitment to addressing the needs of and rescuing Grand Bahama in a meaningful manner. A new ministry for Grand Bahama has already been created with a mandate for ensuring that Grand Bahama receives maximum benefits from all government initiatives. The ministry will also develop proposals for the extension of duty-free concessions to East and West Grand Bahama. <clears throat> the Minister for Grand Bahama will engage in wide-ranging discussions with the various stakeholders in Grand Bahama, as well as with other government ministers, ministries, to advance our priority of restoring the economy of Grand Bahama. This will entail an evolving process as we go forward, <clears throat> and the ministry's organization and budget allocation will evolve and grow accordingly. As well in this budget, we are immediately implementing certain tax measures to promote the revitalization of Grand Bahama. For existing properties in Grand Bahama, the hotel occupancy tax is being reduced by 50% for five years for all properties filing returns under the newly introduced electronic reporting system. And to assist in ensuring the success of new hotels, the hotel occupancy tax will likewise be reduced by 50% for 10 years after <laughs> To access these concessions, it will be necessary for a hotel to register online with the new electronic reporting system, as is required of all hotels in the country a renewed commitment to national health insurance. Our commitment to national health insurance remains solid, and we will pursue preparations for the financially sustainable implementation of such a plan. In addition, we are allocating funds to the Public Hospitals Authority to facilitate the acquisition of new cancer screening technology to ensure that Bahamian women have access to state-of-the-art mammogram machines at both the Princess Margaret and Rand Memorial Hospitals. <laughs> Securing an adequate revenue base and strengthening revenue administration and tax reform. Mr. Speaker, it is clear that if we are to restore the nation's public fiscal affairs, 
to a more desirable and sustainable state. We will need to place particular focus on securing an adequate base for sustaining and enhancing the annual level of revenue. It has been noted by many observers that our tax system is inadequate to finance a 21st century public administration. At a level of 18.6% of gross domestic product, recurrent revenue in the Bahamas pales in comparison to that in many other countries where the government revenue to GDP ratio is in the mid 20% to 30% range. Our tax base is much too narrow, focusing as it does on goods to the exclusion of services. This is simply unacceptable in a modern economy where the consumption of services is predominant. The present tax system is also difficult and expensive to administer and subject to abuse and evasion. As was presaged in the charter and highlighted in the speech from the throne, it is important that we now address the issue of tax reform. <coughs> to that end, a white paper prepared, a white paper will be prepared and will serve as the basis for extensive public consultations. The paper will also serve to underpin the work on tax reform to be undertaken by the Council of Economic Advisers that the government will appoint following the enactment of the enabling legislation foreshadowed in the speech from the throne. A modern tax system can only be successful if it is widely accepted by taxpayers. In turn, to be so accepted, the system must be administered effectively, efficiently, transparently, and equitably. The current tax administrative structure is disjointed, inefficient, and inequitable in many respects. There are currently more than 30 departments and agencies collecting a variety of taxes and fees that constitute both tax and non-tax revenue. In order to remedy this situation, my government will proceed with the plans for the creation of a new centralized tax administration to consolidate revenue collections and maximize the effectiveness and efficiency of tax administration on the basis of international best practice. The mission of the new structure will be to ensure compliance with tax legislation by providing efficient and effective services and by conducting appropriate enforcement activities. When fully implemented, the new agency will feature an efficient function-based structure responsible for administering a broad range of taxes. It will also benefit from modernized arrears management and compliance strategies. A planning and monitoring unit within the structure will be responsible for strategic and operational planning as well as performance monitoring and improvement. Reform and modernization of the property tax system. The real property tax system suffers from a number of critical structural defects. And as a result, annual revenues generated by the system <coughs> fall significantly short of the amounts that should rightfully be collected. The systemic deficiencies have been well documented. It is estimated that with administrative improvements alone, annual property tax revenues could be increased by almost 100% over the next five years. The government will pursue a comprehensive multi-year strategy 
and implementation plan to reform and modernize the rail property tax system. An international expert had been engaged to help guide this process. <coughs> Securing excise tax revenues on tobacco products. <clears throat> the proper control of tobacco e imports and the collection of excise taxes due on such products is another area that is fraught with leakage. It is estimated that the widespread smuggling of tobacco products into the country caused the Treasury, the public Treasury, some $20 million annually in lost revenues. As a means of instituting proper controls and securing excise revenues on tobacco, on tobacco products, the Ministry of Finance is in the process of finalizing preparations with the insistence of the Canadian Banknote Company for the introduction of excise stamps on all tobacco products. Such stamps will attest to the payment of excise taxes, facilitate audit and compliance activities to combat smuggling and secure an important source of government revenue. <coughs> Bahamas Civil Aviation Flight Information Region <coughs> referred to oftentimes as FIR. The government also intends to initiate negotiations with the United States government in respect of the Bahamas Civil, Av Civil Aviation Flight Information Region. Currently, the US Federal Aviation Administration exercises air traffic control over Bahamian airspace from the Miami Air Route Traffic Control Center. Despite the air navigation charges imposed by the FAA, the Bahamas received no funds from the thousands of aircraft which transit our airspace. The government will engage in negotiations on the FIR as a means of enhancing revenues in this area. <coughs> the global economy. The global economy has performed somewhat more modestly than had previously been anticipated. The International Monetary Fund estimates that world output grew by 3.9% in 2011, as compared to its earlier forecast of 4.4%. Likewise, real GDP in the United States expanded by 1.7% last year, as compared to the previous forecast of 2.8%. <coughs> The weaker performance reflected the deleterious effects on financial conditions and market confidence stemming from the ongoing strains in the euro area as well as the impact of the supply chain disruptions caused by the triple disasters in Japan. According to the International Monetary Fund, the ongoing relatively weak recovery in the United States also reflected the ongoing debate on fiscal consolidation with the attendant effects on confidence within financial markets. In its latest World Economic Outlook of April 2012, <clears throat> the International Monetary Fund expects global prospects going forward to strengthen gradually and modestly, as is typical in the wake of financial crisis, though the recovery does remain fragile in the face of persistent and significant downside risks which continue to loom large. Global growth is forecast to decline from 3.9% in 2011 to 3.5% in 2012, with activity in the first half of the year constrained by the ongoing sovereign debt crisis in the euro area. Growth is forecast to accelerate in the second half of 2012, followed by a more robust growth of just over 4% in 2013. Partly reflecting fiscal tightening, U.S. growth this year and next year is estimated by the International Monetary Fund at 2.1% and 2.4% respectively, implying little, if any, reduction in the output gap and only modest gains in employment. This view of only moderate expansion in the United States 
is also supported by the Federal Open Market Committee of the Federal Reserve. At his last meeting in late April, the committee concluded that the United States recovery is expected to remain moderate over coming quarters and to pick up gradually. The rate of unemployment is projected to fall gradually. However, it also concluded that significant downside risks persisted in the face of strains in global financial markets. And these strains stemmed from the sovereign debt and banking situation in Europe. I would note that recent developments in Greece have served to further deepen the strains on financial confidence and stability. The Open Market Committee also noted that the possibilities that the possibilities that U.S. financial policy would be more contractionary than anticipated and that uncertainty about fiscal policy could lead to a deferral of hiring and investment were also noted as the downside risk. A compounding factor in the outlook is the heightened geopolitical uncertainty surrounding oil prices which have again risen and which are expected to remain elevated for some time. In the current environment, low stocks and limited spare capacity pose significant upside risks. The International Monetary Fund estimates that an increase in prices by 50% would reduce global output by 1.25%. The Bahamian economy. The domestic economy continued its recovery from the recession last year, though at persistently modest pace. The Department of Statistics estimate that real GDP expanded by 1.6% in 2011 as compared to almost negligible growth of 0.2% in 2010. The growth of the economy was also somewhat weaker than the 2% rate that had been projected by the former administration in the last budget communication. Both the tourism and construction sectors continued to post positive growth in 2011. The total number of visitor arrivals expanded by 6.3% on the basis of a 9.1% increase in the number of sea arrivals. The performance in respect of stopover visitors remained subdued, with the number of such visitors declining by some 2% in 2011. At the 1.343 million, the number of air arrivals remained well below the recent peak of 1.6 million recorded in both 2005 and 2006 and you would recall which government was in power during those years. As we indicated in both the Charter for Governance and the speech from the throne, the government is firmly committed to implementing the necessary measures to ensure that our country consistently attracts increasing numbers of stopover visitors. The construction sector benefited from the sizable public sector investment projects, such as Bahama development in 2011. <coughs> However, domestic private sector construction activity remained weak, reflecting the general state of the economy. Total mortgage disbursements for new construction and repairs fell by 17.6% on the heels of a 37.4% reduction in 2010. A decline in new mortgage commitments suggests that these subdued trends in the domestic private construction sector will persist through the short term. In light of the absence of a broad-based recovery in economic activity, employment conditions in the country remain challenging. There was, as well, the seasonal entry into the labor force of recent high school and university graduates. As a result, on the basis of the latest estimates from the Department of Statistics, the national rate of unemployment 
spiked to a level of 15.9% last fall, up by over two percentage points from 13.7% in May 2011. <clears throat> the unemployment rate in New Providence stood at 15.1%, while in Grand Bahama, it was estimated to be 21.2%. As I mentioned earlier, Creating job opportunities and reversing the unacceptable unemployment situation in this country are core near-term priorities for the government, especially in relation to young Bahamians, the demographic sector that has been most severely affected by the unemployment problem. Lending conditions did improve last year, with both residential and commercial mortgage rates softening by 20 and 50 basis points, respectively. The 75 point reduction in the prime lending rate last June was a key factor in these developments. However, with only modest improvements in the economy, domestic bank lending activity expanded only marginally and loan arrears remained at elevated levels. Non-performing loans with arrears of over 90 days and on which banks st stopped accruing interest rose by 0.7% to $821.5 million, and the ratio of arrears to loans increased by 13.1%. Elevated oil prices last year, through their spillover effects, led to a more than doubling in the rate of consumer price inflation over the 12 months to February 2012 from 1.5% to 3.3%. Domestic fuel costs in particular were adversely affected. Gasoline prices rose by 19.1% during the year, while the cost of diesel rose by over 32%. In addition, the BEC fuel surcharge increased from 17.07 cents per kilowatt uh, in 2010 to 23.14 cents in 2012, with a peak of 26.29 cents in December. As for the balance of payments, preliminary data suggest that the current account deficit increased by some 34% in 2011 to a level of $1.1 billion with a marked rise in construction-related imports and a higher fuel import bill, the trade deficit worsened by 13% to just over $2.1 billion. External reserves continued to expand in 2011, though at a more moderate pace than in 2010. At the end of 2011, they stood at $884.8 .8 million, up 24.4 million from the previous year. As such reserves at end 2011 were equivalent to an estimated 19.7 weeks of non-oil merchandise imports as compared to 21.6 weeks at the end of 2010. Prospects for the Bahamian economy will continue to hinge on future growth of the U.S. economy. With the ongoing, though gradual, recovery of activity in our major trading partner, and with the significant investment activity that is underway, we expect a pickup in the rate of growth of the domestic economy to the area of 2.5% in 2012, up from the 1.6% growth rate in 2011. Our forecast for the expansion of real economic activity in 2013 at 2.7%, is in line with the latest projection of the International Monetary Fund's outlook. Fiscal performance 2011 to 2012. <clears throat> this budget year that we are now completing. I now turn to the fiscal performance of the 2011-2012 fiscal year. In line with international standards and past practice in this country, <coughs> Our focus will continue to be on the International Monetary Fund's government finance statistics, that is GFS, the GFS concept of the government's deficit. Importantly,
That is the measure of the deficit that represents the additions or subtractions to government debt every year. As I mentioned at the outset, the fiscal accounts are in much worse shape than we had expected as we came into office. Indeed, this year's projected GFS deficit outturn is significantly higher than had been forecast by the previous administration in last year's budget communication. The GFS deficit in 2011-2012 is now projected at $504 million, up by a full $256 million from the previous government's estimate of $248 million. Such a deficit outturn represents 6.3% of GDP, more than double the 3.0% estimate presented in last year's budget communication. It goes without saying that such a dismal deficit result translates directly into a marked deterioration in the government's debt position, both in absolute terms and relative to the size of the economy. Government debt at the end of 2011-2012 is now projected at just over $4 billion, or 50.6% of GDP. That compares to the projected level of 46.2% of GDP presented by the previous administration at this time last year. The bulk of the fiscal deterioration experienced this year is accounted for by a marked overshooting of expenditure on capital account, due in substantial part to a considerable increase in spending on the New Providence Road project. The outturn for capital expenditure in 2011-2012 is now estimated at $399 million as compared to a forecast of $280 million. That represents an increase of $119 million, or almost 43% over target. <laughs> Recurrent expenditure this fiscal year is projected at $1.707 million, up $27 million from forecast. As has been the case in recent years, recurrent revenue for 2011-2012 is expected to under, underperform relative to the forecast with a projected outturn of $1.450 million. Recurrent revenues this year are down by 64 million from forecast. Capital revenue in 2011-12 is projected at 86 million, representing proceeds from the sale of participating note, debt notes of the Nassau Airport Development Company and the sale of successor Wallace Whitfield Center at Cable Beach. <coughs> Fiscal policy 2012 to 2013. As for the fiscal policy in 2012-2013, I have presaged over key, our key message in my introductory remarks. In light of the very serious deterioration in the government's fiscal position in 2011-2012, we must set the fiscal parameters prudently in 2012-2013 in such a way as to begin the process of getting our fiscal house in order yes. while at the same time accommodating our short-term priority initiatives to the fullest extent possible. The fundamental challenge for fiscal policy is at the very large is the very large negative imbalance that has been allowed to develop in respect of the government's recurrent account. The gap between recurrent expenditure and recurrent revenue 
both expressed as a percent of GDP, has quadrupled in the last five years. In 2006-2007, the negative spread between the two stood at 0.8% of GDP. This year, that imbalance has grown to 3.2% of GDP. In the last five years, the ratio of recurrent expenditure to GDP has grown from 17.4% to 21.3%. However, the ratio of recurrent revenue to GDP has only risen from 16.6% to 18.1%. In essence, then, rather than only borrowing to finance productive investments in our nation's future prosperity, the previous administration was also increasingly borrowing to pay for an increase in everyday expenditures in the form of salaries, rent, and utilities that was not matched by an increase in revenues. As we move forward, as we move forward, one of the government's key priorities will be redressing the unsustainable imbalance in our recurrent account. We will do so on the one hand by constraining the growth of recurrent expenditure relative to the growth of the economy, and on the other hand, by engineering a transformation of recurrent revenue to bring it to a more appropriate level relative to the size of the economy. Having stated this reality as clearly and as forcefully as, forcefully as I can, let me be clear. My government fully acknowledges and accepts that the fiscal deficit must be constrained in the short term and significantly reduced thereafter. As such, in the very short period that has been available to us since coming into office, and given the expenditure commitments already on the books for the coming fiscal year, we have done what has been feasible to achieve the objective. As we move forward, we will implement the fiscal measures necessary to improve the government's fiscal position and rein in the growth of government debt. As a means of reducing the government's expenditure in respect of interest charges on the public debt, we are working toward the implementation of a modern debt management strategy. A debt management committee has been established comprising representatives of the Ministry of Finance, the Public Treasury, and the Central Bank to develop and put in action a debt strategy that will lead to lower borrowing costs while minimizing risk incurred. This is being done with the technical assistance of the International Monetary Fund. We will report on progress made in respect of the structural fiscal reforms that we are initiating at the time of the mid-year budget statement in early 2013. In light, however, of the fiscal reality that we face, we are holding the line on recurrent expenditure in 2012-2013 to the maximum extent possible. Recurrent expenditure in the coming fiscal year is projected at 1.821 mil million billion. That is an increase of 114 million dollars, fully 55 million of which is allocated to the increased requirements for debt redemption in the coming period. We have also projected recurrent revenues in a prudent fashion, <clears throat> forecasting that they will come in at 18.3% of GDP. This represents a slight improvement in performance from 2011 to 2012, and reflects the early results of some of the revenue reforms outlined earlier, specifically in respect of excise tax 
and real property tax reform. As such, we expect recurrent revenues of 1.550 million in 2012 to 2013, up from 1,450 million last year. The projected GFS deficit in the 2012-2013 fiscal year is on the order of 550 million or 6.5% of GDP. Let me say it again. In the year 2012 to 2013, that is in this budget year, the projected GFS deficit is in the, on the order of 550 million or 6.5% of GDP. Government debt is forecast to stand at 4,607 billion, or 4.607 4, 4. billion, or 54.5% of GDP at the end of the upcoming fiscal year. And for want of fuller understanding and clarification, let me repeat it. Government debt is forecast to stand at 4.607 billion, or 54.5% 54, 54 of GDP at the end of the upcoming fiscal year. With this level of debt, our debt service requirements in 2012-2013, including both debt redemption and interest payments, will amount to some $328 million, or just over 18% of the total recurrent expenditure. Recurrent expenditure. The detailed allocations by ministry, department, and agency are set out in the accompanying documentation. Clearly, if we are to achieve our overriding fiscal objectives, there will be a heightened need to manage public resources judiciously and prudently within the very stringent limits that have been established. Capital expenditure. As we move into the new fiscal year, the government is confronted with a large inventory of ongoing capital projects. I would note in particular that in respect of the new Providence Road project, fully $77 million is being carried over into 2012-2013. Accordingly, accordingly, we estimate that capital expenditure will amount to some $400 million in 2012-2013, essentially unchanged from the level in 2011-2012. That will represent a 4.7% of GDP, a reduction from the 5% of GDP this year. Revenue measures. The government is introducing a number of measures to further rationalize tariff and excise rates, encourage energy efficiency, and provide relief to consumers, namely, the tariff rate on solar generators is being reduced from 45% to 10% to align it with the rate on other types of generators and other solar equipment. The tariff rate on wind powered and other generating sets The tariff rate on wind powered and other generating sets is being reduced from 45% to 10% to align it with the rate on other generators. <clears throat> the tariff rates on plastic and steel doors are being reduced from 35% and 25% respectively to 10% to align them with the rate of wood and aluminum doors. <clears throat> The tariff rate on body lotion is being reduced from 45% to 25% to align it with the rate on other hygienic products. It, the tariff rate on toothbrushes is being reduced from 45% to free to align it with the rate on toothpaste. The, tar the tariff rate on ECG and EKG machines is being reduced from 35% to free to align it with the rate of kid kidney machines. The 
The tariff rate on filters for kidney machines is being reduced from 45% to free to align it with the rate of kidney machines. The tariff rate on air conditioner parts is being reduced from 45% to 40% to align it with the rate on air conditioning units. And the tariff rate on animal food is being reduced from 35% to free to align it with the rate of pet food. As well, the tariff and excise acts are being amended. The tariff, order, well, general, the tariff, honorable members, we have some order, please. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. As well, the tariff and excise acts are being amended to create new headings for certain products as follows: biodiesel at 45 percent, baby pacifiers from 45 percent to free, and breast pumps from 45 percent to free. Finally, the Tariff Act is also being amended to incorporate a number of tariff headings that were inadvertently omitted from the 2008 tariff. Mr. Speaker, in conclusion, I would reiterate that as the government came to office mere weeks ago, it did so with an ambitious and extensive agenda tailored to tackle the critical economic and social needs of the Bahamian people. The government, and it's with pleasure, this government, was given a decisive mandate to do so. In our very short time in office, however, it has become clear to us that the previous administration has, through its actions and fiscal policies, severely constrained our room to maneuver. Faced, faced with their legacy, faced with their legacy of cost overruns and carryover spending commitments into the next fiscal year. We have moved to begin implementing certain key components of our Charter for Governance yes. to the extent feasible in a fiscally responsible manner. Yes. To that end, I would wish, with some pleasure, yes. to point out to members of this Honorable House of Assembly that the budget includes an allocation of $15 million for the implementation of early initiatives in the Charter for Governance. Yeah. Implementation such as the introduction of Urban Renewal 2.0. Yeah. Including, including the let me, let me drink some water. I'm going to take my time. Take take time. time. <laughs> implementation, implementation, including the immediate implementation of house repairs and community improvements, both of which will create employment. Indeed, <laughs> indeed, indeed, Mr. Speaker, the restoration of fiscal discipline is absolutely necessary if government is to fully implement its agenda for change and play its rightful role in promoting private sector development, new sustainable job opportunities, and higher standards of living. We will, as a priority, restore our public finances to a healthier and more sustainable position. To that end, I want to reiterate the government's firm resolve to redress as we move forward the fundamental structural imbalance that has been allowed to develop 
in the nation's public finances over the past five years. We will implement the important structural reforms that I have set out above and thereby recreate the fiscal policy room needed to adequately implement our policy and program agenda for the benefit of all Bahamians. And Mr. Speaker, I've been here a long time, and my last sentence really is that we remain faithful to our mission to make the Bahamas a safer and more prosperous nation for all our people and to do so in the shortest possible time. There is much work to be done and many obstacles to be overcome. But rest assured that we shall prove ourselves equal to the great challenges that lie before us. Yeah. Mr. Speaker, I conclude.